we look at this particular passage in Ruth chapter 1, we want to talk to you from the subject, from bitter to better. From bitter to better. Bitterness is an emotion that characterizes feelings of anger and resentment because a person feels as though the difficulty and adversity that they are facing in life is unfair. Bitterness is an emotional response to having to deal with very difficult, hard, and trying times. And it reveals through your behavior and through the way that you deal with others that you have been negatively affected by the adversity that has happened unto you. Bitterness can cause you to have hard feelings toward another person. Bitterness can cause you to dislike or even hate certain situations with which you're having to deal. Bitterness can cause you to loathe living and you will even get to the point where you just don't care anymore. Right. Feelings of, I didn't deserve this, or I didn't deserve that. Feelings of, why did this have to happen to me? Feelings of, this life is unfair and I shouldn't have had to deal with what I'm dealing with are all feelings that give birth to the bitterness of bitterness. Okay. If you, it doesn't matter really who you are or where you're from, none of us in this life are immune to the bitterness right. of bitterness. Right. None of us are above the effect of feeling negative because negative things have happened unto us. Right. When you look at the Bible, the Bible shows us that various warns of the children of God have had to deal with this emotion of bitterness because of bitter situations that have occurred in their lives. The children of Israel became bitter because of the gross mistreatment of the Egyptians in Exodus chapter 1 and verse number 14. Esau became bitter and cried with a bitter cry after Jacob had stolen his birthright in Genesis chapter 27 and verse number 34. Job's life was bitter because of the bitterness of his extreme suffering in Job chapter 10 and verse number 1. Ezekiel was bitter in spirit because of the hardness of the hearts of the, of the exiles to whom he was prophesying in Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse number 14. David's life became bitter when the people wanted to stone him because the Amalekites had burned Ziklag with fire and had taken their wives and their children captive. First Samuel chapter 30 and verse number 6. Hannah, Elkanah's wife, was bitter in soul when she was constantly taunted by, taunted by Penina because she couldn't have a child in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse number 10. All of these examples, my brothers and sisters, show us that none of us are immune right. from becoming bitter right. over various misfortunes of life. Okay. None of us are so great. None of us are so well intact. None of us are of such a high spiritual status that we cannot be negatively affected by what is negatively affecting us. Okay. And if we are not careful, my brothers and sisters, life and the various adversities of life can and will make us bitter. But the hope of this lesson is to show us how that God can take us from bitter unto better. This is why God always has to be your choice. This is why no matter who you are in life and no matter where you are in life, you've got to make God your choice. When you make God your choice, you will discover that God alone has the power to turn bitter into better. We find this out as we look at the book of Ruth. In Ruth chapter 1, the last time that we visited this sacred and holy book, we were studying about a woman named Naomi, whose name means 
pleasantness, but Naomi was dealing with some very unpleasant circumstances in her life. First of all, we learn from Naomi that she was displaced from because of a famine that took place in the land of Judah during the time of the judges. Not only that, but because of the famine, she and her husband and her two sons left their homeland in Bethlehem and had come to live in the country of Moab. After spending some time there in Moab, Naomi's husband dies. Ten years later, her two sons die. Now the woman Naomi is left alone, widowed with her two daughters-in-law and bitterness, as we're going to see from the text, has invaded her soul. After a period of time, she has heard how that the Lord has visited his people and that the Lord had once again given them bread in the land of Judah. So Naomi decides it's time for her to go back home to Bethlehem, but Naomi is so bitter that she wants to go back home all by herself. Okay. When you look at Ruth, Ruth chapter 1 and beginning at verse number 8 and listen to what she says to her daughters-in-law, the Bible reveals unto us that Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, go and return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them. They lifted up their voice and wept. With Naomi's words, my brothers and sisters, we can see that as she talks to her daughters-in-law, you can hear the bitterness and the resentment of her soul being expressed when she says unto them, go and return to your mother's house. At this point, Naomi, as their mother-in-law, feels as though they would be better off with their own biological mothers. Them going back to their mother's house, house means that they would once again have a chance at life, while Naomi feels as though her life is over. And since she feels like her life is over, she wants to continue her journey all by herself. There are some things about bitterness that you're going to learn in this lesson this morning. And one of those things is that bitterness will cause you to want to be all alone. Bitterness will cause you to want to be by yourself, just with yourself, dealing with the bitterness that's inside of you. This, my brothers and sisters, is a state of despondency and despair. Whenever you're dealing with something so heavy and difficult that you don't want anybody else around, you're dealing with a bitter situation. When you're dealing with the trials and tribulations of life and you've gotten to the point where your self-esteem has become so low that you just want to be alone. There's an indication that you're dealing with a very bitter situation. As we look at the Bible, the Bible in Matthew chapter 26 and beginning at verse number 36 shows us that even as our Lord was facing the passion of the cross, our Lord's heart was so heavy, his grief was so great, this cup was so bitter that the Lord wanted to be all by himself. In Matthew chapter 26 and beginning at verse number 36, look there with me if you will. Matthew chapter 26 and beginning at verse number 36, the Bible says, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and said unto, unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. Now he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Watch this now. Tarry ye here and watch with me. But he went a little further. Notice how Jesus separates himself from his inner circle. What he's dealing with is so heavy. His grief is so great that he just wants to be alone. That's how you can identify if you're dealing with a very bitter situation in life. If you're dealing with something and 
You don't want anybody else around you. That's a very bitter situation that you have in your life. Lord oh, goes on a little further. Praise to the Father and say, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. It was a very bitter cup that the Lord had. A cup of sorrow. A cup of pain. A cup of suffering. Doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Right. Having to put the weight of the sin of the world on his shoulders to satisfy divine justice was a bitter cup for our Lord to have to bear. Okay. Even in this moment, the Bible shows us that the Lord himself desired that this cup would be taken from him. Uh, the Lord understands when you get to a point in life where you just want the pain to stop. Yeah. The Lord understands when you get to the point where you're just tired of hurting and you just want some relief from the pain that you're having to deal with. The Lord in this text asks the Father that if it was any way possible that this cup would be taken from him, but nevertheless he recognized that sometimes this cup is just God's will. Sometimes bitterness in your life is just the will of God. Sometimes it's just something that you have to deal with. Sometimes it's just a lot in life that you're going to have to face. Yeah. But the Lord shows us that we will never, ever go through it alone. Right. When Dr. Luke records this account in Luke chapter 22, and beginning at verse number 39, notice here in Luke chapter 22, and beginning at verse number 39, when he came out, when as he was to the Mount of Olives, yeah. his disciples part of him, when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. When he was withdrawn from them by the stones cast and kneeled down. And prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, yeah. remove this cup from me. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, not my will, All right. but thine be done. Yeah. Watch this now. And there appeared an angel. Unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Right. When bitterness has made its abode in your life, mm -hmm. God has a way uh -huh. of bringing you through yeah. those bitter moments. Yeah. What God does with his own soul yeah. is what he does with each one of us as sons and daughters of his. Right. He gives us the assurance that even though we may want to be alone, the reality is we are never alone. Amen. Look at Hebrews chapter 13 and beginning in verse number 5. Hebrews chapter 13 and beginning in verse number 5 is a passage of scripture that assures us that in this life and in dealing with the adversities and trials of life that we are never ever alone. Hebrew writer said, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with the things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Or it ought to comfort somebody this morning to know that the Lord is your help. When the Lord is your help. You'll be able to do some insurmountable things. Yes. When the Lord is your help, yes. you can cross over Jordan during flood seas. Right. When the Lord is your help, mm -hmm. you can fight a giant with a smooth stone and a slingshot. Right. When the Lord is your help, yes. you walk out of bondage unscathed. Right. It's a wonderful thing to know that the Lord is our help. Yes. Even the psalmist wrote in Psalms 121 and beginning at verse number 1, 
I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. Yes. From whence cometh my help. Yes. Yes. Psalm is in my help. Yes. Coming from the Lord, yes. which made heaven and earth. Yes. Even during your times of bitterness, my brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. One thing that's going to get you through the difficulty that you're facing is knowing that even though you feel alone, you're never ever really alone. Right. Because the Lord is your help. Right. Not only will bitterness cause you to want to be alone, but bitterness will also cause you to feel useless. Mm -hmm. Look back at our text in Ruth chapter 1 and beginning in verse number 10. Notice that Naomi, that Ruth rather, and Ophrah say unto Naomi, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. Yeah. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughter. Why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Notice here that Naomi feels useless unto her daughters-in-law for what she did have as far as her two sons. She has already given them and now at this point in life they are gone. Mm -hmm. And Naomi says she has no more to give. Right. Listen to the woman Naomi. Why would you go with me? I have nothing more to offer you. It's over for me now. I don't have any more sons. My lineage is deceased. My bloodline is lost. There's no pending arrival of birth coming forth from my womb. I have nothing more to offer you. So why would you even consider Wanting to be with me. Yeah. And anybody in here identify? Mm -hmm. Has the bitterness <coughs> in your life ever made you feel useless? Yeah. Has loss ever made you feel inadequate? Oh, and like you had nothing further to offer anybody? Yeah. Have you ever felt like people were wasting their time with you? Yeah. Expecting something of you that you were never ever able to give? Yeah. Bitterness, my brothers and sisters, will make you feel useless. That's right. But that's one thing that I love about making God my choice. God can turn bitter into better yeah. and show you just how useful you are. When you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and beginning in verse number 25. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and beginning in verse number 25. The Apostle Paul encourages the children of God to consider who they were. And how they were when the Lord called them. Mm -hmm. The Lord just doesn't call the might, the mighty, and the great in order to accomplish his will. Mm -hmm. But much to the contrary. God calls those who are weak. God calls those who have been refused. Yes. And those are the ones that God uses yes. to do great things in his kingdom. Oh, if you've ever felt useless, mm -hmm. you're in the right place this morning. If you've ever felt like a nobody, if you've ever felt like a cast away, right. if you've ever felt like an outsider or the black sheep of the family, right. you in good company this morning because the Bible shows us that God uses such like people to accomplish great things. Amen. Society is used to people who are of a certain status and magnitude applying the occupancy of greatness to themselves. But when it comes to God, God will take the weak and the lonely. God will take the base, the last, the least, and the left out and work with them in such a way that you will wonder how they were able to do what they did. And the testimony is that only God can do something with somebody who others consider nothing. When Paul explains this, Paul says, but consider here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and began in verse number 25, consider the fact that there are those who think that the foolishness of God is wiser than men yeah. and the weakness of God stronger than men. Paul says, for you see your calling, brother, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty and not many noble are called. Yeah. He said, let me explain why. 
Because God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Okay. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty okay. and the base things of the world which are despised. God hath chosen yea and the things which are not to bring to naught things that are so that no flesh can glory in his presence. Okay. Let me lay it in your lap okay. this morning. When you know you ain't strong enough, when you know you're not smart enough, when you know that you don't have the ability to accomplish a great task and yet you accomplish a great task, that's a testimony that God don't have to use great to bring about great. God can use not great to make great because God is a great God. Amen. 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 God knows how to make a nobody somebody. And so if you feel like a nobody this morning, you in the right place at the right time. God can make a nobody into somebody. Give God a giant to fight. He won't send saints. He'll send a little shepherd boy keeping his day and his sheep. Yeah. Standing in before him with a slingshot and a smooth stone. Yeah. And let him walk away with the testimony that the same God who rescued me from the lion and from the bear yeah. is the same God that rescued me from him. Amen. Give God a blessing to give the world. He won't send it through, Meth through Methuselah. Yeah. Methuselah was the longest living recorded human in history. Right. 969 years old. Right. Having children all the time that he lived. Right. But when God got ready to send a blessing to the whole world, yeah. he didn't send it through the man who potentially had the most children. Yeah. He called an old childless man from her of Chaldees named yeah. Abram. Yeah. Chose him with a woman whose womb was shut by himself. Yeah. And told them when they had no children, yeah. I'm going to make you a part of a multitude. Oh, yeah. See, God can make a nobody into somebody. Yeah. Give God a people to deliver from bondage, and he won't send Solomon, but he'll put a slave baby in the river, place him in an ark, guide him to Pharaoh's daughter's eyes, raise him up in the Egyptian Pharaoh's household, and then send him back to bring his people out of the land of Egypt. Give God a multitude to feed, and he won't send manna from heaven, but he'll grab a little boy's sack lunch by the seaside, make the men sit down, have his son pray over it, and then give everybody more than enough to feed everybody. If you ever felt like a nobody, just come to somebody who has the power to make anybody an asset to everybody. That's what God does. He can take a nobody if you just come to him and he can make you an asset to everybody because God can use what others receive. Yes, right. You've ever been received. Amen. You are just right for God to use. Yes, God can use anybody yes, and anything yes. to accomplish his will. Yes. Bitterness will cause you to want to be alone. Bitterness will cause you to feel useless. And then bitterness will cause you to feel worthless. Mm. Oh, when you look back at our text, well. in Ruth chapter 1, and beginning at verse number 12, mm -hmm. Ruth says, Turn again, my daughters, and go your way. I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear son. Would you tarry for them until they were grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sake. Ruth is Naomi is saying, I'm sorry that y'all are even having to put up with me. When the Lord's hand is going out against me. They lifted up their voice and they wept again. But the Bible tells us, my brothers and sisters, that Ophra kissed her mother-in-law and went on her way. Right. But Ruth, Sister Ruth, 
cleave unto her. Regardless of how worthless Naomi felt about herself, God showed her her worth when the Bible recorded the fact that Ruth claimed or continued to claim or hold on to her. No matter what she said, the Bible bears witness to the fact that Ruth wasn't going to give up on her. No matter how empty she felt, she was going to stay right by her side. No matter where she went, Ruth said that she was going where she was going. The true value of Naomi is seen in the actions of Ruth. And Ruth is not holding on for what she thinks she can get, but Ruth is holding on because of what she already has. Yeah. When you listen to the voice of Sister Ruth, mm -hmm. Ruth said, Entreat me not, verse 16, mm -hmm. to leave thee or to return from following after thee. Yeah. For wherever thou goest, I will go. And wherever thou lodgest, yeah. I will lodge. Yeah. Thy people shall be my people. And thy God, my Amen. God, Amen. where you die, will I die. Mm -hmm. And there will I be buried. Mm -hmm. The Lord do also to me and more also. If all but death part me and thee. Mm -hmm. Ruth understood the value of what she already had. To Naomi, looking at her own life, it may not have looked like much, but Ruth saw something that was worth everything. Amen. And I'm so glad that the Bible testifies mm -hmm. that in the midst of disparity and discouragement, in the midst of desolation and darkness, mm -hmm. that there's somebody out there that can see a value in what others are rejected. Right. When the Bible shows us the actions of Ruth, mm -hmm. it shows us that she saw something beyond the pain. Mm -hmm. She saw something beyond the hurt and the disappointment. Mm -hmm. She knew that the bitter in her life would only get better if she made God her choice. Amen. And that's essentially the message for you this morning. Yeah. Yeah. You might have encountered some bitter situations in life. Yeah. You might be in a position where the darkness of disparity is clouding your better judgment. Well, but if you just hold on to God's unchanging hands, God has the power to turn bitter into better. Yeah. When you look at the fact that we've been saved by grace, yeah. it's a strong indication that God can take the bitterness of sinfulness yeah. and turn it into something better for his children. Yeah. And what God does is what he shows us through the actions of Ruth. Mm -hmm. Ophrah, in that particular setting, represents those who will leave you because you have nothing more for them. Mm -hmm. But Ruth, in that particular setting, shows us the character of God that when everybody else has walked away from you, there's somebody who will stay right there with you. Old Ruth said, don't try to make me leave you because I'm going to stay right here with you. And isn't that just like the character of God? Isn't that just like our Father who sits high but looks low? Isn't that just like Him who loved me more than I could ever love myself? He will not only stay with me, but He'll be everything to me that I need Him to be. It doesn't matter what you are in life or what your life has been in life. God knows how to be everything to you that you need Him to be. In, uh, in essence, if you are an artist, God knows how to be to you one who's all together lovely. If you are an astronomer, God knows how to be to you a bright and a morning star. Yeah. If you are an architect, God knows how to be to you the chief cornerstone. If you are a baker, God knows how to be your living bread. If you are a biologist, God knows how to be life unto you. If you are a builder, God to you will be your sure foundation. If you are a doctor, God will be your great physician. If you are an educator, God will be your great teacher. If you are a farmer, God will be 
your sower of the seed and your Lord of the harvest. If you are a geologist, he'll be your rock of ages. If you are a horticulturalist, God will be to you a sweet rose of Sharon and a lily down in the valley. If you are an occultist, God will be your light to your eyes. If you are a judge, he will be your judge of all men. If you are a juror, he'll be your true and faithful witness. If you are a journalist, he'll be your glad news of great tidings. If you are a jeweler, he'll be your pearl of great price. If you are a philanthropist, he'll be your unspeakable gift. If you are a philosopher, he'll be the wisdom of God for you. If you are a preacher, he's the word of God in the page. If you are a theologian, he's the incarnate truth. If you are a Torah, to you he'll be a giver of rest. If you are a statesman, he'll be the desire of all nations. If you are a sculptor, to you he'll be the living stone. If you are a student, he's the word of God made flesh. If you are a sinner, he'll be the lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. And if you just in need of somebody who will hang on to anybody, then to you he's the one that can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Talking about somebody who was tempted in all points like as we are, but yet without sin. He's the one who can see beyond the pain. He's the one who can see beyond the hurt. And he can see beyond the mistakes that you made in your life and recognize that while you may be nothing to others, you still got some value to him. He's a high priest that is affected by what we are affected by. He's somebody who understands what it feels like to be betrayed. He's somebody who understands what it feels like to be lied on. He's somebody who understands how it feels to be talked about. He's somebody who understands how it feels to be misunderstood. And so if you've been in either situation that I just mentioned, why won't you come to Jesus? Why won't you come to somebody who can save anybody and make you an asset to everybody? Jesus can do it for you because he sees value in you when others can't see any value in you. Don't you ever let anybody convince you that you're not worth anything. Don't you ever let anybody tell you that because your mama wasn't nothing, you ain't nothing. Don't you ever let anybody convince you that since your daddy was a scoundrel, that you will be a scound as well. You just tell them that when you decided to put your hand in God's hand, when you decided to give your life to Christ, and when you were baptized for the remission of your sins, that the Bible said old things are passed away, and that everything has become new. I'm a brand new creature in Christ now. My past doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who I used to be, and it doesn't matter what I used to do. I serve a God that has erased my past, and now I am redeemed. I'm more now than I've ever been before in my life, because I understand, like Paul, that it's not me, but it's Christ who lives in me, and the life that I now live by the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me, and who made himself for me. Since I've been redeemed, I now know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. It didn't matter what happened. God worked it out for my good. They may have meant it for evil, but God worked it out for my good. Since I've been redeemed, I can show enough say that the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. Since I've been redeemed, I now know that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Since I've been redeemed, I can walk through the valley in the shadow of death and fear no evil cause he's always with me. His rod and his staff they comfort me. Since I've been redeemed, I know that if God is for me, can't nobody really be against me. Even here at Midway, we understand that there were those who were against us, but the vote of God was for us. And when the vote of God is for you, the devil can stop you. Why would you make God your choice? He can turn nothing into something. He can bring health out of sickness. He can bring 
bring soundness out of a weak mind. God can do anything but fail, but you got to come to him in order for him to come to you. Are you getting this? You got to come to him in order for him to come to you. James said, draw nigh unto God. Y'all seeing that? Draw nigh unto God. You've got to come to him and then he will come to you. Oh, there are so many that are being misguided. Because preachers, pastors, and bishops are telling them to tell Jesus to come to them before they decide to come to him. The Lord himself said, come unto me. Y'all get this? The Lord said, come unto me. All ye that labor and the heavy laden, I will give you rest. Ain't no rest in the bottom. Yes. I'm trying to 
time to stop because we got a meeting afterwards. But I need for somebody to understand now, right now. that God will, with the temptation, the trial, the test, or the tribulation, provide a way of escape. So that you may be able to bear it. Sometimes you're afraid that if you walk out, you ain't going to be able to make it. The devil is alive. The devil is alive. The Lord is my shepherd. And I shall not want. I'm afraid to walk out because I'm afraid of what they're going to do and what they're going to say, baby. The devil is alive. God has not given us the spirit of fear. I don't have to be afraid of anybody or anything. I got God on my side. The beautifulness of that passage is that the Bible shows us when Naomi and Ruth got back to their land, the women said, is that Naomi? <laughs> Naomi's name means pleasant, loveliness, or delightful. Naomi said, no, don't call me Naomi. Call me Ma. Marvel means bitterness. She said, because the Lord has dealt very bitterly with me. The Almighty has taken me out proof and brought me back empty. So don't, don't, don't call me the only one. But just call me Lord. Lord's will, I'm going to finish this lesson this week. Talking about when the game changes your name. Watch us. Watch us. <laughs> When the game has changed your name. But the Bible says, so they returned. And it was the beginning of the barley harvest. It was the beginning of the barley harvest. Lord yeah, yeah, yeah. Bill, next week I'm going to show you that the beginning of the barley harvest. Marks the better. Get ready to have. Y'all get this? Yeah. Yes. The Bible didn't just leave us hanging with Naomi allowing the game to change her name. But the Bible says it was the beginning of the Bible. Baby, there's something that's going to happen. In that barley house. <laughs> that's going to change the bitter into the better. Amen. Don't overlook the fact that if something else is starting while something other is ending, mm -hmm. that God can't bring the better out of the beginning. That's right. But you have to trust in God. That's right. Oh, as the old folk used to say, you got to trust Him. Yes. Even when you can't trace it. All right, yeah. You don't know what he's doing or how he's doing it, but just say, Lord, here I am. Yeah. Whatever you see fit, mm -hmm. use me for your will and for your will. Yes. Is there somebody here this morning mm -hmm. who wants to completely and in totality give their life to God? Religiously, people have said there's so many ways that you can do it. But when you look at the Bible, God only shows us that there is not but one way. Jesus, who is our Savior, has commanded, according to Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, that he that believeth and he is baptized shall be saved. Prior to baptism, you must hear the gospel message that Jesus died, was buried, and then he rose the third day with all power in his hand. The Lord said in Matthew 13, 9, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now you've heard of that. The question is, do you believe? That's right. John 8, 24, Jesus said, Except ye believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. If you die in your sins, where I am, you cannot come. 
So that I cannot afford to die in my sin. Because I want to be with Jesus. Ain't no way in the world I want to let the devil cause hell down here to me. And then die and go live with him in hell. Oh, no. <laughs> no man no sin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The moments of hell that he already provides is enough for me to say, I don't want to be with him. Yeah. And so you have to make sure if you don't want to be with him, that you don't die in your sin. Now, one way to make sure that you don't die in your sin is to repent of your sin. That means you've got to give it up. That's right. Turn it loose. Walk away. Change your nut. Don't ride down that street no more. They push all in there. Stop going over there. Talk about it. Stop drinking that. Stop eating that. Repentance is a change of heart. It is what causes us to consciously decide that I want God to use my mind and my body for His will. The Bible says that we have been bought with a price. And because of that, we have to glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which belong to God. I don't belong to myself anymore. And that's what you have to decide. You have to decide that you have messed you up. Right. And now you want to give you to God so he can straighten you up and fix you up. So repentance is something that you can do from right where you are. You can decide that the last time was the last time. Last time you lied was the last time you lied. Last time you cheated was the last time. I'm just trying to make it fun before. The last time was the last time. And you can decide that right now. But then this next thing that Jesus wants you to do to become his child, he says that you must confess me before me. And you also will I confess before my Father is in heaven. You've got to come down the aisle to do that. You have to stand before these people and verbally say that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then we'll take you and we'll baptize you with water. For the remission of your sins, God will wash all of your sins away. He will add you to the church according to Acts chapter 2 and verse number 47. The Bible says, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. If you want to be saved this morning, then that's exactly what God wants you to do. If you're already saved, but you ain't been acting like you say. Oh, it's time for you to get it together. Because the Bible says that judgment will begin at the house of God. And if it's going to start with you, then you best to be ready. And so you need to repent of your sins. Confess the fact that you've sinned. Turn away from it so that God can use you for his glory and praise on you. Whatever situation you stand in this morning, we want you to come right now as we get to stand in the message.